All right, guys, we are recording. It is March 14th here, halfway through the third month of the year. I do apologize for the hair here. Uh, that's how I know how it's time to get a haircut when uh, when it doesn't go the right direction. So anyway, uh, welcome to the call. We've got some uh, some new people. I don't see them on the call this week, but we've got quite a few new members now. Uh, a lot of people have uh, have hopped back in. There's a new a new spark about the whole SEO world. So a lot of people getting back in for that. A lot of people just getting in for the for the marketing for the ACT program. So anyway, uh, cool stuff. I also want to talk a little bit about some foundational stuff for SEO. SEO is all about expectations, length of time, results, all of that stuff. Uh, I have had the privilege over the last week of looking at a lot of accounts in SitePop, like seeing how people are setting their accounts up and making recommendations to make sure they're going to get the best, you know, the most out of the program. Um, and again, like I said, SEO is about expectations. So there's, there's two kinds of expectations. There's realistic and there's unrealistic. If you're trying to do any kind of an SEO activity and you're expecting or, or you're doing un, unrealistic expectations, you're probably going to be disappointed. So that brings us to keyword selection. If you're in the process of doing keyword selection, whether it be for SEO or pay-per-click or, or any type of advertising, you have to be realistic of what your budget is and what your expectations are. If you're going after ultra competitive keywords and you're on a shoestring budget, chances are your, your expectations are unrealistic and you're going to be let down. And money spent, time spent is going to seem wasted. Now, that said, with SEO, there is no real waste of time and money because it builds equity. But if you've got your site set on something that you're not going to see results for three years, you're probably going to give up before you get there. But what you don't see is you don't see what it's building on the way. So again, <coughs> realistic expectations is what it's all about. So if you're starting a new SEO program, if your site is fairly new, it doesn't rank for a lot of stuff, don't go after the ultra competitive keywords. You know, it's, gonna, it's going to let you down. You have to go over stuff that's attainable. SEO is like climbing a staircase. You can't make the first step all the way to the top. You've got to start on the lower rungs. You've got to build up. You've got to build up authority. You've got to build up quality. You've got to build up trust with Google. Um, that's what our site pop program does. But again, if you're trying to make that step all the way to the top of the staircase in one step, you're going to be let down. So another thing is the fact that if you're trying to make steps up a staircase that's rotten, you're probably going to hurt yourself. <laughs> and, I, and I only bring that up because I looked at a few sites that were, they're, they're what is called very thin. They're thin on content. Like there's nothing there. They've got a, a shell site where there's really no content in there. It's not a rich source of information. Don't expect Google to value a site like that, even when you have the quality signals. You know, SEO, if you, if you split SEO up into thirds, and I'm not saying this is an exact ratio of what's happening, but, but for the sake of this scenario, let's split it up into thirds. And let's say, one third of your SEO is based on incoming links. One third of your SEO is based on on-page content. That's going to be your title tags, your, your description tags, and the actual content on your site. So if you have thin content, you're going to have a very weak link there in the chain. The other third is going to be the user experience. That's going to be sending signals to Google that people know your brand, that they're clicking through to your site, that they're actually searching for you. So 
Think about SEO in that very basic pie, splitting it in thirds. Ask yourself, are you covering all three bases? Are you covering the link building? Are you covering the on-page optimization? Are you covering the user signals? And that's where SitePop fills in that huge gap of user signals because the little guys, like if you're a small brand, chances are not enough people out in the world know your brand or know you by brand name enough to actually go and search for you that way. Google's AI, their artificial intelligence, has figured out over the last couple of years that sites that have brand recognition are bigger, more reputable businesses. Doesn't mean they're better, but they've got an unfair advantage right now because of that. That one third of the pie is leaning in their favor. So site pop is a way to level the playing field on that. So if you're missing that third of the pie, site pop will fix that for you. So, Keep that in mind. So, so have realistic expectations when it comes to developing a search strategy. You know, you can't, there, there is no magic bullet. You know, site pops, the closest thing I can give you to a magic bullet, and it is a magic bullet for that third of that algorithm, but it's not, it doesn't solve everything. You know, you still need some incoming links to show that authority you still need to have content on your site. Google's not stupid. You know, if they see a bunch of people going to a thin site and they can't figure out why, they're going to be skeptical. They're, they're going to not trust that. So if you've got videos on there, that helps a thin site. Like if you've got videos on your pages, that will help get over that trust barrier because now there's a reason for people to be going there and spending time on there. Google may not understand the contents of the video, but they do understand that video is good content and it sticks people to the site. So when they see that, that's a much more trustworthy factor. So again, it's like I've always taught when it comes to SEO, there's one thing as a base that I teach, and that is make it real, make it look real. Uh, I use the cloud cover methodology, which basically means you're fitting in, <laughs> you're, you're, you're blending into the crowd. You're not standing out doing anything stupid. So anyway, I, I wanted to kind of cover that early on in the call here. Just, just, you know, cause I know a lot of you guys, regardless of where you are with your business, people coming to your site from search should be important to you. Because if you think about it, the search traffic, I guarantee you this, this has not changed since the beginning of the internet. Search traffic is the best form of advertising. <coughs> it's the best traffic that you will ever get. And the reason why is it's in-market advertising. It's not disruptive advertising. If you're doing Facebook ads and you're doing uh, YouTube ads and you're doing you know, pay, any other kind of advertising outside of search, what that is, that's disruptive advertising. And for that to work, you have to grab their attention and disrupt them from what they're doing. Like if they're on Facebook, they're not on Facebook looking for you. They're on Facebook talking to their friends. They're seeing who's, who's commented on their posts. They're doing things that are interesting to them. They're not in buying mode. They're not looking for you they're generally not looking to solve a problem when they're on Facebook. They're looking to communicate with their friends. So if you're going to use Facebook advertising and it's going to work, you're going to have to be disruptive. You're going to have to grab their attention. You can't just blend in. If your post looks like everyone else's post on Facebook, you haven't done your job. You've got to reach out and grab their attention. That's why videos, Facebook video advertising is working so well right now. Uh, think about that. If you need to disrupt, what are you going to disrupt them with? And you got to go outside the box. You've got to really think outside the box when you're thinking disruptive advertising. If you're all totally focused on what you do, that's probably not going to do it. You need something shocking. Even if it has nothing to do with your product or service, you've got to shock them. You've got to you know, in NLP, it's called a pattern interrupt. You've got to break their focus. 
They're focused on their family and friends and their comments and all that. So you've got to be able to break that. If you can't break that, your, your disruptive advertising is, is weak and it's not going to work very well. So back to search advertising, very, very different scenario. When people are on a search engine, guess what? They are looking for something. They're looking for to solve a problem. They're looking to fill a need. They're looking for something. They're searching. So when someone is searching in the old times, you know, I say old times, before the internet, you know, like 20 something years ago, when people were in that mode and they were searching, what did they do? They sure they picked up the newspaper and they read through looking for something. Again, they're searching. They were doing a manual search by hand. You know, sometimes they'd go to the library. Again, that's a manual search by hand. And what else did they do? They went out and they asked people. So now they're asking Google. You know, before they'd ask their friends and they'd ask their neighbors, like, hey, you know, who do you use for your lawn maintenance? You know, who does a really good job cutting your grass? They were looking for a referral. They're asking questions. That is what search has replaced. Nobody goes out and asks their neighbor anymore. You know, you don't go and knock on your neighbor's door and say, hey, you know, who's the best this or where, where do I find that? I know, you, I know you use this. Where do you get it? They don't do that anymore. That's old school. That is almost a forgotten art, you know, talking to people. That's, that's like, you know, the younger crowd, they don't do that anymore. They pick up their device and they say, hey, Google, who's the best dot, dot, dot. That's how they're searching. So for you to not be there when they search, when they're in market advertising, when they're in market <laughs> searching, rather, if you're not in market advertising, you're really, really missing a huge opportunity. And that's where search is. So anybody that says search is dead is an idiot. You know, search techniques, people of optimizing in, the, in the old school ways are dead, but search is not dead by any means. In fact, it's, it's probably the most powerful advertising on the planet. So, uh, yeah, Maurice says nobody even goes to conferences anymore. <laughs> that's, uh, that, that's so true. You know, it used to be you'd get out and you'd want to mingle. Less people want to do that anymore. You know, there, there's still a lot of conferences out there. There's still people that go to them. But if you notice, most of them are in an older category. They're not the youngsters. You know, they, they don't, they're not doing that stuff. Yeah, there's Comic-Con and stuff that really gets them excited. But, but uh, you know, I, I just see a trend. So search engines... I guarantee you, the future of advertising, if you're not playing on the search, you're going to get hurt. Your, your business is going to suffer because people are looking for stuff and somebody's going to provide it. So if you're not playing the search game, you're not only letting yourself down, you're letting your customers down because I know you guys have good stuff and the competitors, you're probably doing a better job than the competitors. So if you're allowing your competitors to take all those customers and not do a good job with them, you're not serving them very well either. So it's kind of my, uh, kind of my spiel on that. <laughs> you know, it's, that's just the way I feel about it. So you really need to have search as part of your business plan. And that comes down to SEO. And like I said, in the beginning of this call, Think of SEO, don't complicate it. Don't overcomplicate SEO. There's no need to, it's not that difficult. You've got three main components. Again, you've got linking. You need to have links coming into your site to show Google that other people in the world feel you're important enough to put a link to you, to reference you. Remember I said the old school was people referring. You know, who do you use for this? Who do you use for that? They're asking and receiving referrals in the real world. So search, you need to replicate that. That's how you get, that. that's what linking is. That's what linking represents, is it represents, hey, 
I'm referring my traffic over to you because I trust you. You're a valued source. So when Google sees those links, that's what that means to them. Now, here's something else to consider. In SEO, we're always trying to leverage. We're always trying to game the system. It used to be about the more links, the better. It's not that way anymore. Google is very, very smart. They've got people that are building algorithms to figure things out, and they've got artificial intelligence in play at this point that is giving them information, it's giving them data they never had access to before in the form of artificial intelligence spying on the user experience and telling them, you know, is this truly a quality site based on the user's interaction with it? So think about that in link building for a minute, how that gives Google a crystal ball into whether you're doing SEO or not. If you've got 10,000 links out there that you've built that, you know, the old fashioned way where you're just building links to build links to build links and just, you know, any old link will do. Garbage links, no problem. The more the merrier. If you're doing that, what Google's artificial intelligence is feeding back to them is, hey, this site has 10,000 links out there, but nobody's clicking on them. What does that say? If 10,000 people are referring you and no one is coming, what does that say? That's a pretty big red flag. So don't do that anymore. That's old school SEO. That, my friends, is dead. Don't do it. What you want is you want to link on a site that actually has your customers on it, and you want to link with a click, a call to action to click that will bring people through and give them something of value. When Google sees links like that where people are on other sites, they see your link, they click on it, they come through to your site, they spend time on your site, that is a quality user experience. So when it comes to the link building bucket, that's what you need to strive for. Find partners that will give you links that will feed you the right traffic. A lot of times those are affiliate partners. You can actually pay them. You can say, hey, put this link on your site. It's an affiliate link. So when somebody comes through your link and comes over to my site and buys something, I'm going to give you a commission. That is a great way to build links nowadays. You're incentivizing the person on the other end they're now incentivized to push people to that link to get them to go through because if they go through and buy something, that website owner is going to make some money. So focus that direction with your link building. Now let's talk about the second one. This is your on-page optimization. So link building is, is considered off-page optimization. Your site itself, the contents of your site, that is considered on-page optimization. So let's talk about that for a minute. I, I spoke of thin content in the beginning of this call. Thin content is like just a shell. There's nothing inside. If you're going to have pages that don't have a lot of text on them, you might want to put a video on there so at least you can grab the person's attention and hold them there for a while so you can show that quality user experience. I guarantee you, if visitors get to your site and you've got thin content, they're probably going to click the back button. They might click a page deep, but they're not going to be staying on pages long enough to show value. If they do, uh, you know, let's say they're, they're on your site for three seconds, and it's click, 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 back, out, I'm done. That's a bad user experience, even though they went three pages deep. You know, they've got to be on the site long enough to show value. So you want them on each page for, you know, a minute or more. You know, give them value. Keep them there. Remember I talked about that disruptive advertising. Grab their attention. Do it on your site. Grab their attention and say, hey, this content here is important, and here's why. When you give them a reason why, they're going to consume the content because it's important to them, and you showed them why. If you've got a video, if you want them to watch that video, you better tell them why it's important and what they're going to get out of it and why to watch it, why they need to stay here for five minutes. If you don't, 
don't plan on them clicking the video and watching it for five minutes, especially if your video is not compelling. When you create a video, a video should be created with a formula, with a recipe. And the recipe is to get someone to stay till the end. Now, with the ACT program, I, I teach this A to Z how to do this. You've got to grab their attention up front. You've got to walk them through their timeline. You've got to show them this is how we're going to give you your desired outcome. So you, you're building desire and demand for your product. You're eliminating objections, and ultimately, you want to make an offer. Your offer is always going to be at the end. So if, you, if they don't get to the end of your video, you didn't make an offer, what are your chances of getting a sale? What's your chances of, of turning that into a lead or a prospect or, or a customer? Your chances go off the chart. They just drop off. So it's really important that your content gets consumed. And thin content doesn't get consumed. I think I love short stuff. I love to the point, but it leads you to the next piece. You know, like if you see really good, compelling content, content that's easy to consume and content that is readily consumed, what you get there is you'll have a headline. You'll have a really good, compelling headline. And then you'll have something that, that right below that, you're giving them quality content right below that headline. And then you've got another headline. That's why you'll see these H tags throughout pages. You've got your H1 tag, that's the main header of your site. That's like what this page is all about. But then you've got your, your lower head tags, your H2 tags, your H3 tags. Those are to grab attention. And then that gets them to read the next piece. So if your headlines and your, you know, your tags of on your content, if those are really good, it will grab people and it will suck them into the next piece and the next piece and the next piece. Same thing with video. You know, think about your headlines as topics. You know, you say, when we start this video, you say, this is what we're going to cover and this is why it's important to you. We're going to cover these three things. And this is why this one's important. This is why this one's important. This is why this one's important. So they know you're pre-framing them with what they're going to get out of this. It makes them stick. It'll make them stay till the end. And you say the first one, and then you talk about that one. And then you state the next one. You say, okay, now we're done with that one. We're moving into this one. Remember, we said we have three. Now we're going into number two. So they always know where they're at. And it really, really will help you stick people into your content. It'll help them stay. It'll help you convert. You know, you shouldn't just be interested in traffic. You should be interested in converting that traffic into leads, prospects, and sales customers. So, so those are your two, your two main on-page, off-page. Now let's talk about the third bucket. This is where Site Pop comes in. This is user experience. This is what Google's artificial intelligence is, is discovering about who has good content and what they're looking at. When they started doing this, it was very simple. And they were looking at click-through rate. You know, they looked at if your page was up on Google, you know, let's say you got on the search results page. If no one clicked on it, they thought, this doesn't belong here. So they'd drop you off the first page and they'd test someone else. Because they want people to click. They want people, they want to know that they're providing the right information. So click-through was very important to them. The next thing was bounce rate. If they clicked and they bounced back, basically that was telling Google, Google, you sent me the wrong person. I didn't like it. That wasn't what I was looking for. And Google's not in that business. Google's in the business of providing quality content. So a user could tell them that was not quality by bouncing back. So if you had a high bounce rate, you're sending a lot of signals back to Google's artificial intelligence that your site's not quality. Your site is not what the people want. So how long do you think it's going to stay on page one? It's probably not going to be there very long. So that was what they were looking at in the beginning. 
Then they got a little more sophisticated. They looked at how many pages deep would you go? How long would you spend on each page? How long would you spend on the whole site? And would you come back? Were you a return visitor? Did you have return visitors rather? That was, you know, that was their beginning. Now they're much more sophisticated. So now what they're looking at is, do people know your brand? You know, they've gone a layer deeper. What they discovered by looking at real traffic and looking at sites that have a really stellar user experience, most people know the brand of what they're looking for. So that's why when you go to Google today and you type in almost any search phrase, you'll notice it's all big brands at the top. If you're in a local category, if you've got a local business, you probably have Yelp outranking your site. Not because they're better, but because they have the brand recognition. Everyone's going to Yelp. They're typing Yelp. The, the younger folks, are they're Googling it. They're saying, you know, they're using their, their mobile devices with voice recognition. They're saying, hey, Google, check Yelp for the best pizza place within five miles of me. That's what they're doing. And, and by using Yelp, they're, they're solidifying that brand. They don't know your brand. That's where SitePop will help giving your site that brand recognition. That way you can compete. Like I said in the beginning, search has become an unfair game. It's become a very unfair game and it's given a huge advantage to the bigger brands because of that. And, and again, that's why we developed SitePop to level the playing field, to allow the little guy to fight back and, and be able to play the game. You know, you guys deserve to play too, not just the big boys. Before the internet, the, they had a huge advantage too because they had big budgets. They had money to spend on advertising where the little guy didn't and they just couldn't afford to play. The internet was the first time in history of marketing that the little guy out of nowhere could play the game without spending any money. You know, they could put some time in, they could rank on the search engines, and they could literally play the game with the big boys. And now, as time goes on, it's kind of leaned back to the big boys. They've got that brand recognition. So again, you've got to level the playing field. So one of the ways you can do that, if you're not gonna do it with SitePop, if you wanna do it completely natural, what you're going to try and do is you're going to try and get people to search for your brand. So in all of your advertising, instead of giving them your URL, you'd say, hey, you know, go search Internet Dominators. I would tell people, search Internet Dominators if you want to see my new program. So they would go search Internet Dominators. My site would come up. They'd click on it. Then they'd go through and find my stuff. So it's a different approach. It's a different way to force the brand recognition. but. It depends. You want to do it the hard way or you want to do it the easy way. Uh, all right. So I've gone on for, uh, for half an hour here about search, which I really felt was important. I wanted to get that out and, and just lay that down and get that recorded for uh, not only for you guys, but for everybody else. Cause there's, like I said, I've, I've had the privilege of examining a lot of site pop accounts over the last week. And and giving recommendations on how to get better results. And that's exactly what I saw. You've got to use the right keywords. You've got to use keywords that you have a chance to rank for. Because again, ranking is all about, SEO is all about expectations. If you have the wrong expectation, you're going to be disappointed. And that's going to be the same thing with pay-per-click advertising. It's going to be the same thing with Facebook advertising. You've got to have your expectations in order. You got to know what to expect and why you're expecting it. So one thing I do in, uh, in keyword research, like if I, in this, I do this regardless of what I'm doing. If it has to do with a search engine, I do this. It, it could be for SEO. It could be for pay-per-click. It could be for, you know, for anything I'm doing that relates to search phrases. I'll take SEM rush and I'll run my, I'll run my domain that I'm trying to optimize through SEM Rush, and I want to see what keywords it's already ranking for, and I call that traction. I want to see where I have traction, because where I have traction, I can get the fastest results. 
back to expectations. If I want fast results, I better be working on traction. If I'm going after totally generic keywords where I'm nowhere to be found and I'm expecting fast results, that's a poor expectation. So again, if you want fast results in SEO, you work on traction. And SEMrush is a perfect tool to tell you what you have traction for. You can run a keyword report. You can see where you're ranked. I'll look for any of the, any of the keywords that are ranked in position. Generally, I go for like position three and beyond. If I'm in position three or beyond, I have a much better chance to push those up quicker rather than keywords I'm not even on the radar for. So I'll do that. I'll look at the report. I'll, I'll pick the keywords that I, I have traction for and that I have good content for. And it would make sense for me to push those up. If I'm ranking for keywords that I have no content on the site for, I'll either add some content on the site and proceed or I'll pick different keywords. Because I really, I, I don't want to bring people to a site that they're going to bounce, they're going to have a bad experience. That's called bait and switch, and I do not promote that whatsoever. If you're going to bring somebody through, give them what they came for. If you want to convert, that's what it's all about. You can't bait and switch convert. You're just going to piss people off. They're going to get to your site. They're going to have a bad user experience. They're going to bounce off, and that's going to send that signal to Google. So, uh, so make sure that if you're optimizing your site for a particular keyword, that you have content, that it's going to be a good experience for that person when they get there. And again, it just makes sense. It's a lot of business, a lot of SEO is common sense. It's amazing how little of that I see in the industry. And, and, it, and it's amazing why so many people get into the SEO business and then they get out of it because it didn't work for them. They had unrealistic expectations. You can't just bait and switch a bunch of people and expect to get customers out of it. You know, it's like, it's like being a con man. Once you're discovered, no one's going to trust you. Do you think they're going to buy from you? You know, once you con them the first time, you don't have any trust. They don't trust you to buy from you again. You know, they're, they're not going to make the same mistake twice. So that's what bait and switch does. It gives you a poor reputation. Nobody buys from somebody with a poor reputation. All right, guys. Um, I'm going to open up here for, for questions. If you guys got any questions, come on out and let's figure out what, what's important to you today. <laughs> well, John? Yeah, go ahead, Gregory. All right. Well, I... Of formatting my stuff and uh, and doing some good back testing and all, but a, a, a thing in the back of my mind was fees. You know, what do you charge? And after today's allegations and the college scandal on the LA Times, these people were charging a pretty penny and getting paid. And they said, like, you know what? That kind of works. So, and when you said about the bait and switch, is what is exactly what I keep coming across some of these trade some of these trade offers come and join our program for $7 and then they want to charge you $50 a month if you continue on. They don't tell you that unless you look at the terms and conditions at the very bottom. So the bait and switch thing, you just say this <laughs> and what's going on in the, in the news and then my, that back of my mind, what, 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 what do I charge and where I find customers sort of like reaffirm my, comp, my, my confidence that yes, there are people out there. You just got to just find them. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. As far as like the uh, the thing that you described there, when you when you bring someone in for a, a trial offer, let's say they come in for a dollar or seven dollar trial, and then you're you're bumping them up to a recurring model, you've got to be really upfront with that. You've got to disclose that in a big way up front. Otherwise, you could get in trouble with the FTC. The FTC is very much anti theft, and they consider that theft. They, they consider that trickery and they are very against that. So, you know, the, the FTC is there to protect the consumers. So if you're coming off with a, with some sort of a ploy to rip off the consumers, you are putting yourself in major legal jeopardy with the FTC. So you can't do that. 
it's simply not worth it. I, you know, some of the internet marketers have gotten hit, but you know, from similar things and you know, you can say it's to make an example, but it's, it's just, they, they probably deserved it. You know, they were probably doing something that the, against the FTC's terms, which FTC is really tricky. You know, for any of you that are, are in here, you know, I promote uh, Chip Cooper's legal guardian, uh, or FTC guardian, rather. And it's a program where he, he basically does all of your terms and services, your privacy policies, and gives you a widget where you can plug those into your site, and you're legally covered. He also does a lot of uh, a lot of webinars to educate you, and and one of the things that that he goes through is, you know, he shows you how you can stay out of trouble, or you know, there's a, there's no way to hundred percent guarantee anything, but he shows you the best way to to you know to do your stuff in a safe manner for your business and to protect yourself personally, and you know one of the things they're they're really really strong on is when you do testimonials if you're doing a testimonial and the testimonial states specifics you've got to be able to back those up and you cannot put out testimonials anymore where you're giving specifics that is not the norm like if you're giving your superstars testimonials like the best of the best you have to literally say that this is this is not a typical result, but that's not even good enough anymore. You have to state what the typical result is. If you're going to give a result and it's going to be, you know, any kind of a result, good, bad, or, or whatever, you have to state the typical result of your average customer across the board. You've got to quantify it. So like with weight loss programs, we all know that most of them will fail and it's not because of the product it's because of the user but it doesn't matter if your average user and the truth is most waste loss products if you took every user of the product and you got an a, a truthful answer out of them after a year most of them probably gained weight so you would have to say in a testimonial you could say you know Jackie here she lost 30 pounds in 30 days but the average person using our product gains 10 pounds in the first year. That's what you would have to do to be legitimate to the FTC. So, you know, testimonials like that are almost not worthwhile anymore. You've got to, uh, you've got to state your testimonials in a way that they're, they're generic and they're not specific. You can't say specific things without coming back with a retraction and saying, this is what the average user gets. So be very careful with that stuff. Um, you know, that, that, that is really, it makes it really difficult for us as marketers to do that too. And, uh, and yeah, Gregory says, if you're going to make a claim, you've got to have the proof for it. And, and that's not, even that itself is not enough anymore. You could prove that, yeah, she truly did lose the weight 30 days. It's documented. But that's not enough anymore because you're making a, a broad-based assumption by making that claim that this is the average claim and everyone should expect that. And that's where they'll get you. So you've got to say the average user, you know, does this. So when you're, when you're making claims, you can make all the, all the non-specific claims you want because you don't have to quantify it. You could say, you know, uh, she got a significant reduction in, in weight. You're not making a specific claim. Uh, she got a, you know, a, a non-specific outcome. You, you need to put things into those terms. And again, I'm not an expert on that. If you guys are, are doing testimonials on your site, I highly recommend that you use uh, Chip's thing. It's in our resource area. I believe the the link, I have a short link to it that's internetdominators.com forward slash FTC, and that should take you to it. But uh, that's a that's a really good thing to do if you're if you're making any kind of claims, if you're doing testimonials and you've got endorsements, anything like that on your site, you want to make sure you're covered because 
if you're not, you could get taken down like in an instant and there's no way to back out of it. Once they've got you, you're, you're pretty well screwed. And it's a, it's a very, very nasty process. <laughs> so be very careful with that stuff, guys. I can't, I can't, uh, I can't stress that enough that, that when you're making your claims, you got to make them within the parameters of the FTC guidelines. All right. Uh, any, anything else here? What else is uh, on your mind? Hi, John. Hey, Lewis. How's it going? Pretty good. And I want to share with you a file, if possible, in the chat. Because today on Google Analytics, it show up a message that basically said, it is in Spanish, so you maybe not understand that, but they say your conversion in the top pages is not very high. And it, I do think it is a clear message about you have to improve your conversion or I'm, going, I'm not going to send you traffic. Okay. That's a really good point because that's the same thing in Facebook. If you're doing Facebook advertising, they track conversions. And the reason they're tracking conversions in Facebook for that is so they can send you the right traffic so you can actually convert more. But with Google, conversion basically, that's another form of a metric that they can tell if this is a quality user experience or not. So what we do with SitePop is, is uh, one of the things is we try, and, we try and land every visitor on the contact page because Google has a soft understanding that the contact page is a commitment. It's a conversion. Even without a conversion tracking pixel and all that, Google knows that if somebody goes to the contact page, and they're looking to contact, you know, probably the phone number, probably call. And then what we do is we close the browser out after that. So if you've got a, uh, if you've got an opt-in form and Google understands you have an opt-in form and they, again, their artificial intelligence is figuring a lot of the stuff out. So let's say you have an opt-in form and people are coming to your site they're not opting in, so they're not seeing the thank you page for the opt-in. They know that's a conversion, even if you're not running conversion tracking pixels on your site. Google pretty much has all that data. When you put the conversion tracking pixel on it, so you can have that data displayed to you. Google has the information displayed to them anyway, because they're tracking every motion, every movement. So again, that, that's an interesting thing that you, you brought that up and brought that to our attention because I had not even considered that as part of their AI, but it totally makes sense that they would be uh, aware of that and watching that. That's a, that's a really, really interesting thing. In fact, for SitePop, it might make sense for us to add the URLs for all of our conversion pages and have those pop in there and just hit them all. <laughs> that's uh, thank you for bringing that to my attention. That's, that's a brought up a great idea. Joe, you have your, uh, your hand raised. You want to unmute there? There, I just unmuted you. Yes. Oh, you, okay. How are you, John? Good. How's it going? I'm good. Uh, yeah, so we're, okay, so the first thing I want to ask you is I got a, an email from YouTube saying, what the hell did it say? Basically that they were going to tear down my, my account because I had uh, illegal content. Uh, and what it was, I, you know, I think one of my uh, assistants put a link up for a YouTube video. It was a minute long to Simon Sinek. And I'm going to show you, they like tagged me. They said, you have three choices. Number one, take it down within seven days. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, you know, uh, oh yeah, here it is. Copyright takedown notice. Okay, sure. Should I be worried about this? Uh, well, they'll probably remove it anyway. I, I don't know that they would actually 
kill your account over it, although they could? This is what they say. Do nothing. We can take it down. Oh, they're going to add a copyright strike. Okay. And I think yeah. if you get three strikes, you're out. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Because I, I know baseball, so I don't want to be at uh, Yeah, you don't want to be at the plate on your third strike. <laughs> yeah, I would remove it. I would go in and, and just get rid of it. What will happen, sometimes you'll make a video and you'll have some background music. And sometimes they'll automatically flag the background music because they know <laughs> all the copyrights to all the music. That happened, but they put a note saying, like, it was, like, I couldn't use it for monetary purposes. Or so I had, like, the mamas and the papas, but they didn't give me this, like, a copyright strike. And now I got a bunch of videos that I want to start. I mean, I have a ton of videos up there. I'm like, shit, I don't want to get banned now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would probably remove it just so you don't have Okay. How do I, but how do I in the future... Because what got me was this was just a regular video that, you know, maybe I could share it with you. It was just a Simon Sinek video. It was like a, a minute long, but it was the company. It wasn't him. It was the company that produced the video. Yeah. Well, if you're in YouTube, they allow you to edit videos and then try and like make them your own. I, I know in the IM space, there's a lot of people selling programs like that where you don't have to create your video content. You can go steal other people's content, you know, and, and that's a little shady to begin with. Oh, no, no, I don't want to do that. You know, what yeah, I do I'm, is. I'm not saying you did that, but I, I'm just <laughs> making, a, making that point that there's a lot of people doing that. But what happens is if you've got a piece of video, even if it's a clip and, and someone else technically owns it. If they see it and they make a complaint, then that's what will trigger that from like Yahoo to send you that notice. Right. Okay. So my question is, how do I, is there like a, a like a, an icon that says, oh, this is copyrighted or. No, there's, there's really not. I mean, tech. How the hell do you know? Okay. Well, well, here's the general rule of thumb for copyright. When you create something, whether it's written or verbal or, you know, like music or anything like that, any kind of a, a asset that you create, you, it, you own the copyright on it automatically. Right. Okay. For you to legally enforce the copyright, you've got to send in, you know, a document to Library of Congress to, to stake your claim to it. But you actually own that right before you do that, just by you creating it. You know, if you can prove you created it, then it's yours. And you can technically legally block anyone else from using anything that you created. Uh, that's the general baseline rule of thumb for copyright. Like if you write an article. Okay, yeah, I understand that. Uh, you know, I try to put the copyright thing on everything, but... What if I'm, I'm just sharing a video, his video, it says, I didn't take credit for it. I didn't say I made it. I was just saying, hey, my topic is, you know, have a purpose. And Simon Sinek is about, you know, start with your why. I mean, I'm just putting a link up there to a, to a YouTube video. If you're sending a link, I wouldn't think that was, because that's just. All right, we'll, we'll have to talk about this, but uh, I don't want to waste everybody's time. No, no, that's not a waste of time. You know, whatever you're doing, everyone else has, you know, probably got the same thing. So yes, that's, that's what this call is for, to figure out, you know, whatever is important to each of you is going to be important probably to all of you. So, all right, so I'm going to see if I could share this link with you on the chat, and then you can tell me in my... I don't see any problem at all with making reference and then sending a link over to someone, but it's when you have their, uh, when you actually have their content in your video, that could be a problem. No, nah, no. Nah. How do I uh, send a link here? In the chat box, you can paste it in. You can, you can paste no, the link. Let me do that. Oh, wait, maybe I'm in the wrong... Oh, it should, yeah. should be a chat window you can paste into. <clears throat> but I, I, there's never, never that I know of, there's ever been any kind of an issue of putting a reference to something and then sending them over there for more information. Um, I've never seen a problem with that. 
But okay, when, yeah, there's the video. Okay, got it. When you incorporate uh, someone else's material into your presentation, that's where you can run into trouble. If you no, that's what scared me. I'm like, I got a bunch of like, you know, topics. Vince uh, Lombardi, I'm like, yeah, I want to talk about tenacity. And, you know, so I put Vince Lombardi up there. Okay, yeah. I have never seen a problem making references to people and even even quoting them, especially when you say who, you know, who it was. I thought it, I thought it was always uh, as long as you gave them credit. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. Typically, that's the way it is. So I'm going to share your uh, video here and let's see what we got. What do you enjoy most about what you do? There is something magical about being Okay, so I'll I'll just stop you right here. Did you make this video? No. That's the problem right there. Somebody made this video and they complained about you having it on your Yeah, the people that that first uh whatever that splash screen was. Yeah. Yeah. That's who put the uh capture your flag they put the complaint in okay yeah so if that's if this is your youtube channel and you're posting this video that that's the problem right there i thought i was doing them a favor <laughs> no you're not not really they're you're you're republishing their content on your okay so that that's the problem right there All and right. by the way i love this guy this this guy is awesome so, oh yeah, yeah. I I, I love listening to him. He's, oh, I ain't quite, yeah. From when his, I think one of his first TED talks was uh, was huge. Yeah. So what you would do if you wanted to do this, what you could do is in your video, you would come on yourself and talk about this and say this. There's a really awesome video. I think you guys should watch it. Uh, click the link in the description below, and you can go over and you can you know you can see for yourself. Ah, okay. That, that's the way you would do that, and and not have okay. any any issues. Right. So yeah, I would remove that from your from your channel right away. I <laughs> yeah, I think I'm gonna remove everything now and start from scratch. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you know, uh, we got the boot camp coming up in yeah. a couple of weeks, and I have a table. So you know, I feel like I have all the right pieces. Like, I know who I'm targeting. Uh, I have an offer. I got all the stuff, but I, we're, I need to put it together. Okay. Yeah, we've got, I think I've got you scheduled for Monday. Yes. We're scheduled for Monday at 2, I think. Yeah, what could I do before? I was just going to go through all of your videos, all of your past videos, and just see what I could pick up. Okay. Well, for... What we're going to do, and for those of you that don't know, Joe just got it, got into the apprentice program. So with the apprentice program, basically I'm here for you for whatever you need, like whatever you're working on. Some people are working on different things, different stages, but originally it was to create your first marketing campaign, you know, to take A to Z, a, a complete marketing campaign. But a lot of you are, you know, have been in situations where like, like Joe, like, hey, I'm going to this event. I need to make this a successful event. So we hop in right there and solve that problem. So for you, Joe, you know, to prepare for that the best for our meeting on Monday, what you want to have is everything that you've got, all of your assets, you want to have a decision on what, what do I want as the outcome here? Do I right, want okay. to generate leads? Do I want to make sales? Sales on the spot is kind of hard to do depending on what you've got and how high your offer is. If you've got a low offer, it's a, it's a piece of cake. Oh, I got something I think is freaking ridiculous that people, okay. if they don't want it, fine. Yeah, yeah. You're, <laughs> In you're, fact, you're, I might be giving them too much, but that's why I want, I want you to say it. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll check it out. But uh, you know, on a low offer, that's the best thing to do if you're trying to capture, uh, you know, a sale on on contact. Yeah. Because you don't have to have a long process for that. It's not a big buying decision. And what you can do if you sell them that first little thing, you get them in, you provide massive value, and then you make them the second offer. And right. Okay. The offer is after the fact. Right. 
So once they've bought from you once, it's, it's much easier to get them to buy again. Yeah. You taught me that. Yeah. So getting that first sale is really, really important. So I don't mind like splintering out a very small thing to do that, to accomplish that. Right. I got it. Because it, it'll allow you the opportunity to show them the massive value that you provide. And then the next sale is really easy. The next yeah. Sale. That's why I'm looking at, you know, because I'm typing out all the bullet points that I'm going to give them. And then, you know, like, you know, but, that's not all, you know, the whole Ginzu knife uh, pitch. Okay. Well, <laughs> Plus, here's, act here's now. Something, here's but, something too that'll really help you because I know what mode you're in right now. Yeah. In in creating those bullet points and everything. And here's what you need to do: you need to shift your thought process on the bullet points. And every bullet point you throw up there is why is this important? And okay. What, what that will do is that will switch your your train of thought to benefits instead of features. Because what we all do when we start bullet pointing out what they get, we start putting down what's important to us and what we feel yeah. is important to the program. And they don't care about that stuff. They care about what's important to them. So rather than putting features, I'd rather put the benefits in that list and three-dimensionalize them if possible. You know, when Okay, you is that the, uh, like imagine this or how would you feel? Yeah, when you three-dimensionalize it, you're saying it in a way where they can hear it, see it, and feel it. So right. the hear it part is, hey, this is the benefit. This is what you're going to get. This is what it's going to do for you. And then the that's the hear it. Then the see it is you can say remember. And then you, you, know, you use something that they can remember a point in time where they had that feeling or they had that outcome. And then that will that will bring that back. They can they can see it when they remember it. They remember a visual, and they'll bring that visual up, and then they can see it. And then the feel it part, you can take them to the feel it part with a, the word imagine. You know, imagine how you're going to feel when this is happening, and you know, you can take them to the feel it part that way. So hear it, see it, feel it. That's how you three dimensionalize a benefit. In that in that order, it doesn't matter. They usually in that order. They have to hear it because hear it is the least important. So you want to get that one out of the way first and then see it and then feel it because you're building now. You're building desire. Right. If, if they just hear it, that's one thing, and it's kind of like water off the back of a duck. But then when okay. you, know, you suck them in and then they see it, they, you've just advanced them up to a higher level, and then they, you let them feel it. The first thing is get their attention, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm looking at all the stuff that I'm offering them and I'm like, maybe I need to take some of this away for the follow-up offer. Yeah. yeah. I was like, want... shit, what else am I going to offer them? Yeah. You don't want to get your first offer too, con too convoluted. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to put that together for our, our meeting. Yeah. Your first offer, you need to make it very simple. It should be just a simple no brainer offer if you put too much stuff into it, you're, you're complicating the decision process. Right. Like I'm you, famous for that, John. If you tie five things in, they might really want one of the five, but now they got to decide, well, do I want the second one? Yeah, no, nah, I could do without the third one. And then all of a sudden they're like, no, nah, no. Oh, yeah, their brain is just like, yeah. I, I can't decide. I won't buy any of them. Exactly. Simple sells. So, so try not to complicate your offers. Make one offer based on one desired outcome. That will be the simplest form or the simplest way for you to convert a, you know, a, a prospect to a sale. Right. I got it. So simple offer and no brainer, lot massive value based on an outcome they want. If you can figure out, you know, what does this one thing, what is this widget solve the problem for and then you target the problem you say hey, let's solve this problem for you and solve this problem for 30 bucks you know you want to do it yeah i think so <laughs> you know, a simple you know no-brainer decision for them right i got it and then if they say no you can just simply ask them well you know what's holding you back is the problem not you know is it really not a problem for you and you know if it is then you'll get the answer of what's holding them back. 
you know, maybe price is an issue. Shouldn't be an issue on a low dollar thing, but you know, it, it might be. And if that's the case, if price is an issue anywhere. I don't care how expensive your item is. If price is an issue, what that really means is you haven't provided the value. You've not displayed the value. So your value proposition is out of order. So they're not saying they don't have the money. They're saying, I don't see the value. That's right. Okay. Typically, the, typically what it boils down to when it comes to price is they don't see the value. That's awesome. That helps a lot, John. Sure. Absolutely. All right. Anything else? Anybody else, sir? Russ, you look like you're unmuted. Hey, John. How you doing, buddy? Good. How's it going? Good. So I finally got around to get my site pop things go, sites going, and I installed uh, the Windows version twice. Okay. And both times I came up with an error, and I don't know if it's me or how I would get support about that. Okay, what what's the error? It says, unhandled exception error occurred in application to continue this application, uh, continue or quit to close. Okay, so that's after you've installed it, you're getting that pop-up window? Yes. Okay, that particular pop-up is because of a communications error. So it might be you have, might have an unstable internet connection. It might be you might be on a rotating IP and the IP address changed during the communication. It's not a problem. It doesn't mean your software is broken or anything. All you have to do is just hit continue and it'll start right back up. So if I'm at a company that has a firewall, are there specific ports that need to be open for the software to work properly? Or how would I know it's working properly? Well, if the if the window pops up, it definitely means there's something in the way of the communication signal. And, and it's pretty common. I get it on my computer because I have a, this, the one I'm on right now is a, a Windows desktop. And I probably get that error popping up maybe two or three times a week. And for me, it's, it's just a, an internet connection that comes in and out. So, and again, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong. There'll be some times where I'll go weeks and no error at all. And other times when my internet connection's shoddy, I'll be getting it three or four times a day. So when you get that error, what do you, do you just click? Just, just click continue. Okay. All that does is it just restarts and, and it just picks up right where it left off. I, I didn't know if it was something to do with the installer or if it was something to do with the application as it's running. No, no, it's a, it's actually neither one. It's the the SitePop app is communicating with our server to run its program, to run its, uh, it, it gets its instructions from us. Okay. We'll say, you know, run this keyword search, do these, use these parameters, all that. So when it's doing that communication, if there's any break in that, in that chain, then the program basically stalls and errors out and that error pops up. So once you hit continue, it just resets and it starts back over and no, no harm done. <laughs> so uh, another question then, if I look in my dashboard, will it tell me if that application stopped on that computer? Um, it will tell you like in your dashboard, let's say you're running this on a, on a client and it's running on their computer. When you look in your dashboard, you can tell if their computer is active or not. It'll be red or green. Okay. And if it's red, then it means that their, their application is not running. Now, they might be closing down their, their computer at night, and that's perfectly fine. So it would show up red when it's not running. And then when they start the computer back up, it'll automatically start, and then it would go to green. Now, how about if the computer goes to sleep, like say inactivity for if, a half hour, I'll go to sleep? If it goes to sleep, then it's technically offline, so it's not communicating. So what happens is when, when your computer's asleep during the daytime, you're not getting credit. So you might get less activity for your project if that's the case. It's okay to be down at night, but during the day, that's when most of these searches are run is during the daytime. Okay. So you want to make sure that uh, you know, you're up as much as possible during the day with your, uh, with your devices. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for your help. Sure. No problem. All right. Anybody else before we close out here? 
Hey, John. Hey, John. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. I, I sent you a quick email earlier, but I'm I'm trying to put together. I got to put together a quote for a client that may need some SEO work done. Okay. So, do you want me to send just send you the domain? To yeah, or? yeah. Send me the domain, and I'll uh, I'll run a couple of searches on it and kind of do a background check and see what uh, what what kind of evil pops up. <laughs> Yeah, they've been they've been really successful on Amazon, and they've just they've just built their sites out not too long ago. Okay, cool. They don't rank for anything uh, that they need to right now. Gotcha. Okay. And they've got no reputation, except maybe some negative stuff. So they've got their uh, hands full. Okay. Well, yeah, negative stuff. A lot of times, what happens there is they just they don't have anything to prevent the negative stuff from coming up. Yeah, they've got they've got no rep, they've got no management plan. It's just it's only one or two reviews. Okay. So, okay. So. Yeah, for anyone else that's kind of in that in that category, there's a, a site called Noam, and it's in our resource area too. If you want to get the link for it, but it's called Noam, and what it is, it's a service that will sign you up for all the Web 2.0 properties in one shot. Okay. And that way, you know, it'll, it'll give you like a hundred properties of all the social media accounts. And just because your name is in the account, that gives you an insulation against, uh, you know, that reputation coming up and biting you. Okay. It's okay. when you, when you don't have any of that stuff, there's nothing in the way. So the first comment, boom, it's right to the top. Hmm. So if you've got hundreds of those sites, you know, when you search for your name, all this stuff comes up and it gets in the way and it prevents that stuff from crawling its way to the top. Hmm. So that's something that uh, that you might want to point out to them too or, or offer that as a service. You can buy the service from Noam and resell it to them. Well, they've been, we've taken, we've gone out to their key, the top keywords in their industry and we've been running it through my program and we've pushed them One's gone from like 79 to 62 in a, in a few weeks. And so oh, okay. some of their words they want to rank for are starting to be pushed up. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I said, that's good. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. But once you get to page one, um, you need some better window dressing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I was talking about earlier on the call, the, the thin content being, uh, being a problem. Yeah, their, their site's good. Their content's good. They've, you know, they've, uh, they're winning awards and they can add some more. They don't do YouTube. They don't do email. Um, I think we talked, talked about it before. They're, you know, 20, $30 million a year <laughs> uh, making lots of money hand over fist in spite, of, in spite of themselves. Yeah. 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 Well, cool. Yeah. Shoot me an email with that. I'll, uh, I'll take a look at it for you and, and get back to you with what, uh, what I come up with. Okay. Yeah. I sent you one email and if you've got some time, we can maybe have a call. Okay. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't gone through my mail for this morning yet. So after yeah. the call, I'll get through there. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. All right. Cool. Uh, Mariette, just to answer your question real quick, uh, if you want to assign a device to a different project, just log out on the device uh, there's a little logout button, like if you're on the Android device. When you log out, it'll ask you to log back in, and then when you log back in, you can just put the project code for the other device in there, and then you'll be switched just like that. So really easy to do that. So just log out. When you log back in, change the device code, and you're you're all set. All right, guys. Any uh, anything else before we? Uh, close out here for today. I do want to thank you guys. Uh, all of your input, your input is what makes these calls great. Because I don't know, you know, where you're stuck. And I don't know, like, I, I do know that whenever somebody asks a question, it everyone else gets the benefit of the answer. So I, I really like that you guys ask questions. There, there are no bad questions either. So don't ever think you've got a bad question. So, all right. Thanks for uh, thanks for being on here and participating, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks, John.